2013's The Lone Ranger was Disney's grand master plan to reinvigorate the blockbuster western genre the same way they did to the pirate genre with the pirates. And the actual essence of their plan to achieve this was fairly straightforward. Click on pirates, press ctrl C, click on a desert, press ctrl V, and there you go. The style of the movie is the same, the feeling of the movie is the same, the people making the movie are the same, overall it's the same. So then obviously great success was inevitable, nothing could possibly go wrong. All the super funny roasting jokes aside though, I do think there is a lot to enjoy here. I love the dry, gritty look of the film. I appreciate Disney trying to give us something nobody else after Cowboys and Aliens would ever dare to give us. And like I mentioned in my Spider-Verse video, I really respect the style of visual reversal comedy they go for here by playing with assumptions and reality. I'm in. Catch. The United States Army. Finally, someone who will listen to reason. But despite all those positives, and partly even because of them, the only success the Lone Ranger ever found was in being a record-breaking flop. It cost well over 300 million dollars to make, and it made back just a bit over 100 million, which gives it a somewhat of a loss of around 200 million US dollars, which by public information makes it the biggest blockbuster box office bomb of all time. And even though I'm sure there's multiple factors at play as to why that is, the biggest one that I see can be stated with just one word that I just mentioned the word blockbuster. See, although the original definition of blockbuster is any movie that makes a lot of money, like Joker for example, today that word has shifted a bit to mean something else. Something called manufactured blockbusters. Meaning movies that from the very start are manufactured with incredibly massive budgets to appeal to all general audiences in order to make a lot of money. And when you're creating a blockbuster movie for general audiences, there's a couple rules you need to follow, a couple pitfalls you need to avoid. And here comes Lone Ranger, and literally stumbles into every single one of them. The movie is slow to the point of getting boring. The movie is convoluted to the point of getting confusing and nonsensical. The movie is internally conflicted to the point of having no clear identity whatsoever. And when you put all these together, here's the result. And so today, let's use The Lone Ranger as an example to investigate these blockbuster pitfalls closer in order to see what happened here and how to avoid it in the future. Here's how to fail at being a blockbuster. The first big blockbuster crime The Lone Ranger commits is being a slow movie, which for general audiences equals a boring movie. I'd say the film does get a lot better at this toward the end, but the first hour for example is so excruciatingly sluggish that by the end of it most moviegoers have already lost all interest in it. And the reason it feels so sluggish is because it never introduces a clear strong plot to encompass what this movie is or why we should take interest in it. The movie begins in the future, where through this random kid we meet old Tanto who serves as a framing device to tell the story. Pretty much nothing happens here, but to be fair, it is our doorway into this world, so fair enough, acceptable. And after six minutes of that, the real movie finally begins. Run a man all the way to state line, put him on a train and ship him right back. Don't make no sense. Where it is, Cavendish is looking for payback with you, Dan. Reckon so. Basically, the gist of the opening is that we have this evil outlaw Butch Cavendish being transported to this town in Texas to be hung, and we meet all our central characters as they wait for the train to arrive. And that's the key issue right there, the fact that we're just waiting for the train to arrive. There's no goal we're chasing, no objective we're trying to complete, nothing we're moving towards. There are some bad guys preparing to spring Cavendish free, but our main hero John, for example, has absolutely nothing to do with that, or even any knowledge of Cavendish. Our other hero, Tan does, but at this point we don't know that, which is the same as him not having anything to do with any of it. And we'll get more into that later. So overall, the first 18 minutes of the movie is people just casually waiting and hanging out, which makes it feel like we're sitting in a roller coaster ride just waiting for the ride to start moving. Until after 18 minutes, it finally does. Anyway, I'm sure we'll be at the station any minute.
Then we get this action sequence on the train which does help alleviate our build up boredom and then as Cavendish has escaped, after 30 long minutes the movie finally actually seems to properly begin when we finally get our main plot related goal of going after Cavendish. But even now, there's still a problem. We're missing the other plot components of stakes and urgency. We have no clue what evil things Cavendish has done or to who because we've never seen any of it happen. And so why do we need to stop him? Why should we be invested in stopping him? What happens if we don't stop him? What are the stakes? And in addition to that, why do we have to stop him right now? What's the deadline? What's the urgency? The answer is, there isn't one. Which makes this whole riding after Cavendish section feel very pointless and boring. It's like a roller coaster ride has finally started moving, but only slowly slides forward an inch at a time. Because a movie without stakes and urgency is like a roller coaster without drops and loops. Until... Take something from me. Be damn sure. I'm gonna take something from you. Once Cavendish kills all the rangers and Johnny Depp does some more strolling around, John wakes up from the dead and the movie begins again as it finally enters its second act and introduces its main proper all-encompassing plot. Now we have a clear strong personal goal of stopping Cavendish and we have a clear strong reason to do so, because he killed our brother. There's still no real urgency established here but to be fair it does function pretty well even without it. The only problem is that at this point it's been 50 full minutes and that's it's 30 minutes too long, because at this point most of your audience has already checked out for good. And in blockbusters meant for the masses, you need to streamline this stuff. Instead of showing casual moments where characters just wait, you need to actively personally involve them in situations. Instead of starting and restarting the movie over and over again until it finally fully starts after 50 minutes, you need to cut out this second start section of going after Cavendish and fuse it with the opening. Have our hero John be the one bringing Cavendish to town to face justice because he believes in justice. And then when the Cavendish gang shows up to spring him free and John fails to prevent that, his brother has to come in with the other rangers to salvage the mess he made. But then that leads to Cavendish killing them. Now you've done everything you did in your current version but in a way that's instantly clear and interesting and only takes 25 minutes to get through. Because with general audiences you can't afford to wait 50 minutes for the full ride to start. It needs to start fast and it needs to start start strong. The next key issue with The Lone Ranger is that it seems to be a bit too smart for its own good. See, this film by nature is very complex. There's a bunch of characters and subplots and all kinds of narrative stuff going on at once, which in of itself isn't a problem. Complex is fine, as long as you give the audience enough red string to be able to follow along. The problem arises when that red string isn't given and the whole thing becomes convoluted and thus nonsensical. For example, look at our main villain Nathan Cole. At the beginning, we don't know he's our villain and and instead he's established as a nice sympathetic guy with the scene he has with the family of our hero John's brother. They don't make men like your husband anymore. In fact, I envy him. Fine family, son to carry on his name. I just hate to see a bird in a cage. Overall, this scene comes off as very clunky and weird, because at this point the movie has given us no context whatsoever to understand it. What is the relationship Cole has with the wife of John's brother? Why does he think she's a bird in a cage? Why do we have this whole subplot of Cole wanting to be close with her and her son? Obviously the real answer is because Cole is the one behind her husband being killed and he feels bad about it. But we are given no reason to think that or anything else until like an hour and 45 minutes into the movie. And so up until that point this relationship makes no sense and the only sensible reason for it to exist seems to be that the movie is just forcing it to happen in order to function later. Plus there's still the question of why is Cole so obsessed to make this family his own? And again there is a great answer. It's just so quick and subtle that most audiences aren't gonna notice it. Oh no no Mr. Cole. No, by all reports Mr. Cole is uh, well he is no longer guided by the same imperatives as other men. Mr. Cole, Gilding. Come to think of it, there was talk of an incident during the war. Wait, 
The full person defining motivation for Cole is the fact that his wiener was blown off in the war. That's why he wants to make this family his, because he can't create his own family. That's why he has an obsession to be the most powerful man in existence, because he has a deep insecurity that him not having a wiener makes him less than all other men. But aside from this one quick exchange of throwaway lines, the movie never clearly establishes any of that. We don't see scenes showing how Cole struggles to form his own family. We don't see scenes where he's made to feel less than other men. We just hear this one quick verbal exchange. And general audiences aren't gonna pick up on that. Which means that for general audiences, this great three-dimensional person will come off as just a two-dimensional movie character. Which is the same as him being a two-dimensional movie character. And even though that's just one example, the same mentality applies to pretty much everything in this movie. Well, if what you say is true, that would mean I attacked the Comanche for no reason. That's right, Captain. Slaughter of the innocents. Their blood on your hands. Are you capable of that? There's this whole conspiracy subplot of using Indian turf silver to gain full control of the railroads, but we don't even know that conspiracy is going on or that our villain doesn't already control the railroads until near the very end when it's paid off. There's a big reveal where Cole turns out to be Cavendish's brother, but it doesn't really pack much power because the movie didn't reveal to us that there are two evil men until like 20 minutes ago. When Tanto is trying to kill Cavendish at the start and blabbing on about Windigos and spirit walkers and whatever for over half of the movie, we have no content for any of that, and it just comes off as nonsensical and dumb, which is a bummer because the actual explanation for it is incredibly powerful. In exchange for a cheap pocket watch from Sears Robot, they both showed them where the river begins. They took what they could carry, but they wanted to keep the place a secret. The boy could not live with what he had done, so he decided the men were possessed by evil spirits in the sewer. He called it Wendigo. And with general audiences, you need to give out that red string. Here, for example, you should have cut out the whole framing device opening that doesn't have anything to do with current events and instead opened with the flashback of Tanto's tribe having been killed to clearly set up the silver conspiracy and the horrors of the Windigo so that we understand that these scenes aren't just nonsense but that there is something deeper there. Obviously, don't give us all the answers but give us enough for us to not only have a sense of what is going on but also to have a sense that something is going on. Super smart subtlety can be interesting in smaller indie films, but when you're making a 300 million dollar blockbuster for the average Joe, it isn't something you can really afford. The final blockbuster pitfall the Lone Ranger stumbles in is a pitfall that pretty much every blockbuster has a danger of stumbling in. And that is the fact that because these blockbuster movies are so massive, the talent that gets involved in them is often powerful enough to be above the material. Meaning that very often there's a danger of the material changing purely to serve the needs of the talent, to the point where the material and thus the movie loses the core of what it is. For example, what is the main reason the movie begins with old Tonto? With The Lone Ranger, the initial drafts of the script were written by Pirates writers Terry Rossio and Ted Elliott. But when director Gore Rabinsky then felt like he wanted to add his own flair to it, he brought in another writer to do just that. Not to write a brand new version of the movie because this old one was already greenlit, but instead to just add new stuff on top of it. Which led to the result that for most of the runtime, this one movie is actually two different movies fighting against each other. Take the comedy for example. As much as I appreciate the fun visual stuff Rabinsky does here, a lot of it just doesn't mix with the more gritty emotional core of the original version. We get this flashback scene where John hears that Tanto's whole tribe was killed because of a mistake he made as a kid and that his mind was broken as a result. And it is incredibly emotional. But then in the very next scene, this happens. Exactly. It is a good day to die. Yeah, well, same to you. Yeah. So let me get this straight. One minute we have this super emotional reveal where John finally understands Tanto as a person, and then the next minute we have a goofy joke where John is ready to leave Tanto for dead just because he's annoying. Like wh what? Leaving Tanto for dead isn't something this person who just learned this highly tragic truth about him would ever do. This goofy moment just doesn't mix with the scene that precedes it, and instead it just ends up ruining all the emotional charge we just built up between these characters. Same with the moment 
moment where John stops Tonto from killing Cavendish. Wendigo cut out brother's heart. Where is brother's justice? I'm not a savage. The reason John won't let Tonto kill Cavendish here is because he firmly believes in the law and due process above all else. And it is a pretty strong moment. Until you remember that, wait a minute, didn't we have this funny joke earlier where John accidentally beheaded two of Cavendish's men? Yeah, we did. I'm not a savage. So then, why is he so adamant to uphold the law here? He's already killed two people himself. What integrity is he holding on to anymore? The answer is none. Because just like this moment highlights, there are two incompatible versions of the movie continuously devouring and sabotaging each other in a way that neither ends up working. Another good example of this is the continuous thematic battle between fantasy and modernity. In the original script, the writers lean very heavily on all this fantasy stuff about evil Windigo spirits and whatever and you can see a lot of it in the finished product. An evil spirit born in the empty spaces of the desert. Nature is indeed out of balance. But because Verbinski felt like he was less interested in fantasy and evil spirits and more interested in the theme of progress and evils of corporation, he then changed the ultimate direction of the movie to be more grounded. You spoke of her in your vision. Lack of oxygen can cause the brain to hallucinate. Everyone knows that. All these years, I think you are Windigo. But no, you are just another white man. The Windigo. Nature out of balance. Just a story, right? Up to you. And the problem is that because the movie first introduces all this fantasy stuff and then never fully commits to it, we never get explanations or any kind of payoffs to any of it. The only payoff we do get is when the movie at the end just says that it's up to us whether any of it was ever real or not. And that's not how that goes. You can't use ambiguity to cover up the fact that your movie never finishes what it started. Which is why, in many ways, the final product here feels very much like watching The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi in the same movie. Look, letting talented people do their thing is important, but that means actually letting them do their thing instead of just letting them add their own flavor on top of existing material. Because how can you ever recommend a movie to someone else when you don't even know what movie it is you're recommending? How can a movie ever hope to achieve success at the box office when it has no identity whatsoever to achieve that success with? And if you disagree, fair enough, but let me ask you this. You know who pretty much always does put material over talent? You know who pretty much always does have talent serve material instead of the other way around. This one teeny tiny place called Marvel. And from what I hear, they're doing pretty well out there. Better than this, at least.